Our first speaker this morning will be Professor Pablito by Badu. He teaches theology at the University of St. Thomas, Manila, and is also the Executive Secretary of the FABC Office on Education and Faith Formation. Prof. Pablito will speak for 10 to 13 minutes. Please, Prof. Prof. Pablito. Good morning, Your Eminences, Excellencies, Sisters, Brothers, and Friends. I belong to the Mother of Mercy Quasi Paris in the town of Marilao, the Diocese of Malolos, Bulacan, in the Philippines. The parish is situated along the way to Maykawayan, an industrial city. Every day, this road is teeming with hundreds of motorcycle riders on their way to work. It's a very busy road. That is why it is important that I go earlier for 15 minutes than usual because traffic gets congested in front of the church. Not because of anything, but due primarily to all the motorcycles stopping to pray at the Our Lady of the Mother of Mercy. After a few moments of prayer, then off they go. It is inspiring to witness the throng of riders doing the stop, pray, and go. The same thing happens again when they come home in the evening. Father Edward Pexon, our parish priest, said that this practice is by far one of the best devotional practices that has formed and deepened the faith of his parishioners. From the point of view of constructivism, the leading and most influential theory of education today, it can be said that the stop, pray, and go dynamics is the very structure that facilitates the construction of a deeper meaning of the Christian faith. Constructivism is an important learning theory which is based on the idea that people actively construct or make their own knowledge and that reality is determined by the experience of the learner. In short, it is a theory that places so much value to human experience and encounter as a way of constructing meaning, forming good values and deep moral conviction. In my view, the significance of constructivism is allowing the learner, the faithful for that matter, to discover meaning through the interaction within the given landscape. This resonates what Pope Francis in a number of occasions would call the culture of encounter. In his morning meditation at the chapel of the Domo Sancti Marta, Pope Francis invites us to work for the culture of encounter in a simple way as Jesus did, not just by seeing, not just by hearing, but listening, not just by passing people by, but stopping with them, not just saying, what a shame, poor people, but allowing yourselves to be moved with compassion. The stop, pray, and go dynamics is the experience at the corner of the church in front of the Our Lady of the Mother of Mercy that indicates the relation of the church, work, and home that nurtures the life of the motorcycle driver. It is at this juncture that the home and the work are weaved into a moment of prayer. What needs to be emphasized here, in my view, is the importance of constructing a landscape where the church, in a sense our Christian faith, becomes the uniting factor of the many aspects of our daily endeavors. The landscape that connects the work, home, and the road, which gravitates towards the church during the stop, pray, and go, forms the person to a deeper love for his family by working harder and more diligently. 
Seeds just don't grow well anywhere. They need a good soil and other elements to bloom into a hundred flowers and bear fruits. Faith formation then is the challenge of designing and redesigning existing structures and programs to facilitate the encounter, create an experience for which the seed of faith gradually but steadily grows into maturity. I have four kids and due to the demand of work, they, together with my wife, would consider me as an absentee father. It is not that I wanted to be an absentee, but we live in an economic and social structure that force both parents to leave home before sunrise and return when kids are already sleeping soundly. In all honesty, the pandemic has been somehow a blessing because we are able to recover what we lost for the longest time, eating, praying, watching, and playing together. Thus, if there is any lesson that we can learn from the pandemic, it is precisely the value of the family with parents having quality time with their children as the best approach to faith formation. I think that our work on faith formation demands the church to challenge the social, cultural, political, and economic structures that irritates and destroys relation within families. The church should advocate at various levels for a new social structure that places the integral unity of the family as the highest value. Moreover, it is also important for me that we need to rethink the family parish relation as we return to our pre-pandemic mobility. We may want to open and redesign our parishes and institutional spaces for families to come for a stop, pray, and go experience in the form of picnics, sports, or other forms of cultural encounters, especially for the poor and the marginalized at any given day. Redesigning Paris as a venue for family encounters is a must if we have to counter the increasing mall culture and secularism that continues to disrupt family relations. Faith formations in this way requires formators to be more like gardeners, designers, and engineers. There should be a shift in the attitude of faith formation from knowledge building towards building relationship. In the words of Archbishop Julian Liu Beng Kim, a member of the OAFF, the most important aspect of faith formation is building a relationship that will go for the next 10, 20, 30 years or more. It is inspiring to note, for example, that the youth group that he has started 20 years ago remained his friends until today. Such friendship continues to nurture each one to grow in holiness while it bears fruits in the respective works and ministries. A formator who can be the parish priest, the bishop, the father, the mother, the teacher, the catechist, the manager, anyone, must be equipped with a strong sense of sensitivity to the situation and present realities and with the given resources in a particular situation and context, creatively design the parish, the diocese, the home, the working environment into a landscape where everyone is both welcome and that through its elements and their interconnectivity provides the scaffolding towards growth in the Christian faith. Miko, my second child, has been the most exploratory among my kids. He went to three schools to finish his junior high school. His world was beyond imagination that practically made me and my wife 
regular visitors at the principal's office. At a certain point, I said, it is enough. Amy, my wife, however, never gave up. She has persistently embraced Miko and even literally ran after him in those days. Without her motherly care, an almost irrational and unbelievable care to an erring wild child, Miko could not have finished his degree and may not be the person he is today. Faith formation, I think, should have the character of a mother. Loving the child at all costs is what is most important, but such love is every day translated into a creatively thinking, what else can she do? What more can she do? Where else can she bring Miko to change his ways and all sorts of wanderings and wandering? And in all days, her prayers must have been her greatest companion more than me in those trying moments. In the words of Bishop Antonio Subianto, Benjamin OSC, our chair in the OFF, he reminded me that looking into this reflection, he said, accompaniment is the essential element of faith formation. Accompaniment is not the construction of a subject, but a construction of a social condition for subjects to shine and discover their God-given talents. The art of accompaniment as a form of faith formation is therefore the motherly attitude of allowing ourselves to become instruments of God as church in various levels and degrees, patiently serving for the transformation of individuals and families as image and likeness of God to become light to others and at the service of a multicultural and multi-religious societies. In closing, stop, pray, and go. Emphasize the primacy of experience and discovery over rationality and formalism as the very landscape of designing our faith formation programs. Thank you to Bishop Anton and Archbishop Julian for their guide, and thanks to Father Rico for his inspiration in, in writing this reflection. And once again, thank you for the joy and privilege of sharing with you my thoughts and experience. Have a good day. Thank you, Prof. Uh, please stay on the stage. Cardinal will give you something. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Pablito. Uh, there will be time for question and answer, but after the next speaker. So let us now take two minutes of silent prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now. Our second speaker will be Mr. Alexander Lopez. 
Mr. Alexander Lopez is the regional manager of the external world television network, EWTN. He will speak for 10 or 13 minutes. Please, Mr. Alexander. Hello and good morning, Reverend Fathers, Your Excellency, Your Eminences, and everyone participating in this morning session. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of FABC 50 celebration, and of course, congratulations to everyone. I am delighted to share some inputs on revitalizing the life of the church, especially on the aspect of digital ministry. As we all know, the church has been pushed to go to digital, to use online platforms brought about by the pandemic. I mean, schools, churches, offices had to adapt and be familiar with online technology. With these digital services available during this time, we were able to continue operating and reaching out to our fellow brothers and sisters. Online streaming, online masses, online rosary, online adoration and devotion became a big part of our lives nowadays. And with 2.2 billion online users in Asia alone, and with 91% on mobile devices, the church was able to continue reaching out to people despite the pandemic challenges. And I think it would continue to use digital technology given we are also now facing an economic situation. We all know that streaming and posting content on platforms have become normal. We have what we call the big tech companies. Social media has become a normal thing that we use on our daily lives. Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, and we have those influencers. And we all know that these platforms owned by this big tech are of course driven by advertising. It is their business model. And of course, since they own it, they also set the rules. In technical terms, it's called algorithm, and, but you know, in layman terms, it's you know, rules, set of rules. It's like a house. I own my house, I set my rules. And come in a country, they have certain laws. In the platforms, they have what they call algorithms, rules, that they, they set, that users should follow. Now, I cannot help but wonder, of course, sometimes I ask, being also in the development uh, industry, since these big tech platforms own and operate their platforms, and they set their rules and algorithms, do they share the same values as our? Do the same the same values as the Catholic Church and the teachings of the Catholic Church? Are they pro God, pro life, pro family, pro marriage? These are the questions that I always try to ask. People who run these big tech platforms definitely, definitely, they can say. This is right, this is wrong, this is my rules. Because they control everything, algorithms, to what they call artificial intelligence, machine learnings that run, that they have placed in it. Because understandably, they own it. But, I cannot help but wonder also, if they don't have the same values as the Catholic Church, can they suspend your account? Can they censor your content? Can they limit your reach? They can, can they manipulate the likes, the dislikes, the sad, the angry emojis? I mean, can they cancel? Cancel is being used daily now. And of course, can they control the narrative to fit their agenda? Let's say I'm a pro-life and I have a pro-life page on Facebook. Can they put my content to pro-choice pages? And so therefore, I would receive dislikes, angry emojis, and they can control the narrative. And so since they can manipulate, they can produce fake news, create trolls and bots, and use it to their advantage. 
I think this is the scary part as well of the big tech companies. If they don't share uh, the same values that we have in the Catholic Church. So what is the remedy? There is always a solution. We can build and operate our own platforms. For me personally and my team, we are tasked to, in EWTN Asia Pacific to build platforms from the ground up so that we can set the algorithms, so we can control at least what is happening in there. Uh, we have, let's say, Netflix. We now have EWT and Flix available also. Uh, we're, what we're using now here, the virtual environment platform where we can freely express our Catholic views without being restricted or censored by anyone. And we can agree to disagree without canceling each other. I think it is important. We believe that dialogue is important, right? I mean, the Catholic Church is rich in talents and resources, especially in building platforms, especially in content. You, your eminence, your excellencies, reverend fathers, you are the influencers. You have followers. But really, more importantly, the Catholic Church provides answers, not promises. You bring answers, not promises. The Catholic Church provides answers, not promises. You know, when a person is faced with personal issues like addiction, alcoholism, abortion, unwanted pregnancy, people are looking for real answers. I remember when I was 20 years ago, I had cancer. My wife was pregnant. I was looking for real answers. I actually promised God that if you keep me alive, I will serve the church. I found answers in the church, found answers in the Eucharist, in the adoration, in the rosary. The church provides real answers, and these answers should not be suppressed, censored, limited, canceled by a simple platform based on their algorithm. But of course, it is still important, you know, aside from having our own platforms, we also need to produce compelling content compelling stories because in the digital age the story is the strategy the story is the strategy compelling stories can stretch the fast decreasing attention span I think it's only now three seconds you know because when you browse into Facebook or you can easily just go from one content to another content if it is not compelling to you and so it is still important that we develop compelling stories so that we can cut through the noise surrounding today's digital environment. And with that, I think the next speaker would talk about content creation for the church. Again, thank you so much. And I hope I was able to share some of my insights, some of my recommendations and solutions for the digital ministry of the Catholic Church. Thank you again. And God bless. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Uh, our next speaker will speak about the same topic. It's also about the digital ministry. Mr. Brinstone Carvalho. Mr. Carvalho is a full-time member of the media ministry in the Archdiocese of Mumbai. Please, Mr. Carvalho. If you are wondering why my face looks familiar, it's because I am not wearing my white shirt that I have been wearing over the last uh, seven days. Um, your eminences, your excellencies, dear bishops, religious priests, and esteemed guests, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you. In the short presentation of mine, I would like to lay emphasis on the use of creative catechesis, which also includes content, in digital ministry. The church has always taken a positive approach to digital media. The pastoral instruction on the means of social communication underlines the church sees media as gifts of God in which in accordance with his providential design 
unite men in brotherhood and so help them to cooperate with his plan of salvation. Furthermore, the great Saint Pope John Paul II declared, it is not enough to use media simply to spread the Christian message and the church authentic teaching. It is also necessary to integrate that message into the new culture created by modern communications. Therefore, doing that is all the more important today since not only does media strongly influence what people think and act upon, but also to a very great extent, human experience itself is an experience of media. Pope Francis very boldly says, the digital world can be an environment rich in humanity, a network not of wires, but of people. Now the church in Asia is no stranger to the power of the internet, the power of media, and of course the power of technology. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the church took digital adaptation to a whole new level. There was a widespread application of digital technology to the Eucharist, worship, pastoral care, discipleship, and missions. While the churches rushed to create digital provisions with little afforded time to training and of course deep reflection, most of us, most of the church, largely acted in accordance with their theological instincts. However, technology and the format of media use changes the rules of play of human interaction. How then can the church in Asia today, moving ahead of the pandemic, offer new ways of confronting people with the message of the gospel? Communication in and by the church is essentially communication of the good news of Jesus Christ. And just like how Jesus connected with his people in his time, the church today needs to connect with her people in the means that they understand. Through storytelling, the use of using the power of metaphors, and the explicit need to be relevant to the times. All of these together form the core of creative catechesis. I work in the Catholic Communication Center, the media wing of the Archdiocese of Bombay, and our motto is communion through communication. Using this motto and creative catechesis, we spread the mandate and the love of Christ through word, worship, and witness. Our main goal is to evangelize the lay faithful using creative catechesis. Now, creative catechesis can be done through various modes, static posts, infographic, short videos, and podcasts. The essential purpose of creative catechesis is meant to take something complex and break it down into something simple for us lay people to understand without losing any essence or meaning of what is being conveyed. This is what I believe the church in Asia needs to be working in the way forward. May I remind you that creative cate catechesis is not only a medium to communicate with the youth, but in fact, of peoples of all ages. Allow me to share with you a few examples of how we in Bombay use uh, creative ca catechesis effectively. The Ten Commandments, as you all know, helps us with an examination of conscience. But perhaps a more relevant and creative ex uh, and personal examination of conscience with Jesus may bring about a change of heart indeed. Saints are the pillar of our church. Short, selective, specific material on saints help the faithful to get to know more information and key information about the saints. Furthermore, we can also Im inspire the faithful with powerful quotes from these saints. These are all simple static posts. An example of a short video is right here. This is something that we did for Lady Sunday where we acknowledge the contributions of all those who serve in the church.
as phones are the first and the last things we, we look at during the day, perhaps mobile wallpapers are a, nice, are a nice reminder of God's presence in our lives. Here is an example of using simple daily computer commands to encourage the people to follow the footsteps of Jesus. Control C, Control S, something that all of us are aware about. Creative catechesis can also help sow seeds of vocation. Here is a short promo video of a vocation promotion campaign done recently where priests from the Archdiocese of Bombay on a road trip together share experience during their formation years and ongoing journey in priesthood. I'm Father Byron. I'm Father Nigel. I'm Father Ryan. I'm Father Baptist. I'm Father Joshua. I'm Father Ashwin. I'm Father Omar. And then you sent your disciples into the world asking them to go forth and make disciples of all nations. Creative catechesis also allows you the freedom to tackle sensitive issues in a light-hearted way. This is the campaign that we run during the season of Advent. And finally, as a last example, creative catechesis helps you to stay relevant to the times. These are posts we've created with the latest trends on social media. I'm sure most of you have an iPhone, the triple camera, and of course, the 10-year challenge. Now, if you didn't understand the last two slides, or perhaps a few other slides, then it's a concern and brings me to a very, very important point. This is a challenge that needs your attention. The clergy, priests, bishops, and religious need to know and understand, at least at a fundamental level, the purpose and the beauty of social media. And more than that, the clergy needs to be aware of the latest digital trends and happenings perhaps even some form of training on the use of digital media. And more importantly, take serious actions to implement its use. The sheep are on social media. The shepherds are also ought to be. The shepherds need to keep up with the times. But I guarantee you that the clergy is not alone in this, and there is help available in the form of Catholic media professionals in your parishes, and the formation of communication cells in parishes and dioceses. My experience of working in the digital ministry in the Archdiocese of Bombay is a fulfilling one. It is not about the likes, the comments, the reach, the shares, or the number of views, but the sheer passion of sharing the values and the teachings of the church in a creative way. I would like to emphasize on the fact that creative catechesis is not a substitute to physical participation in the sacraments, but only a method to further revitalize digital evangelization. The future is digital. There is no doubt about this. Honestly, I would have never imagined receiving a spiritual communion. What's next? We have no idea. Without doubt, the task at hand is easier said than done. The quantum of work, the time, the effort, and costs involved are huge. Additionally, there are plenty of challenges, not only uh, in developing creative catechesis, but also consuming them. For example, negative comments and feedback, sometimes political pressure, low internet bandwidth, lack of interest, and the great challenge of tackling fake news. 
But I believe there is hope. And there is hope when I look at the bishops and cardinals out here. Asia looks to you to lead the way forward for the priests and the lay faithful. I'd like to conclude this presentation with a key quote from St. Paul VI, perhaps because of whom we, are, we have the FABC and are here today. Pope Paul VI said, the church would feel guilty before the Lord if it failed to use media for evangelization. And therefore, I sincerely hope that the church in Asia, joining together with her peoples and with this general conference, recognizes the need to keep up with technology and social media, and also strives to ensure its application in dioceses and parishes. I thank you once again for your opportunity to address you, for your time and for your attention. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Carvalho, for your presentation, for reminding, uh, reminding us for the beauty and the promise of the social media, but also the challenge we are facing in this area. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, the last speaker before our break, is Bishop Sebastian Francis of Penang. He is president of the Catholic Bishops Conference of Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei. Please, Bishop Francis. Dear Brother Bishops, Fratelli Tutti, well, allow me to confine myself to some reflection and a paradigm for worship and formation based on all that has been expressed here in the last eight days. And it is the same spirit, whether we are in Lex Orandi or Lex Credendi, from worship to formation, or Lex Vivendi in life, it is the same spirit that is moving surely, clearly, gently among us. And everything that has been expressed from our hopes to our disappointments, to our failures, to our aspirations and uncertainties simply means that you have brought what your people are experiencing. So let's move on to worship and see if there is pressure now on us as we move to the second part of this conference that we have to address the people of Asia and the people of our churches and give them a direction. And as the Archbishop of Manila said, are we able to speak with authority like how Peter spoke? We and the Holy Spirit have decided that this is the direction for the church in Asia. Could we have that kind of confidence to regain our role as successors of the apostles. So let's move first to the first slide, which is about worship. And it is in the context of an encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And I can't help but feel when I listen to this text that actually uh, we experience this more intensely during the pandemic when there was no more public worship. And Jesus told her, yet a time is coming and has now come. And that he said 2,000 years ago, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the narrative on worship was not about the morality of the Samaritan woman who had several men in her life. The narrative of worship was not about religion, which on which mountain shall we worship, whether in Mount Gerasim or in Mount Zion or in Jerusalem or wherever. The narrative on worship was not even, uh, not about gender, that Jesus, male and 
the Samaritan woman female. And it was not about race and ethnicity and so on and so forth, he being a Jew and she being a Samaritan. But it was about worshipping God in spirit and in truth. And many of us made an interior journey during the pandemic. And all we could cling on to when there was no more external worship was the obligation to continue to worship God in spirit and in truth. Carrying our people in our souls when we came before the altar to celebrate the Eucharist. St. Faustina said, a single day without the Eucharist is a dangerous day in the life of a bishop or priest. And what about the people? Yes, many of us were tempted not to celebrate the Eucharist because there was no audience. There was no um, congregation. But it still remains that we celebrate the Eucharist vicariously. And regardless of whether there is an audience or no audience, we carry every single person entrusted to our care into the Eucharistic table so that nobody is left out. And I wish to plead again that could the Eucharist and coming from Asia focus not on being a reward for practicing Catholics or baptized and practicing Catholics, but a, not a reward for fidelity. But can the Eucharist be a nourishment for the wounded, the sick, whether they are sick physically or spiritually, and a nourishment for sinners? So these are some thoughts about the Eucharist. Next slide. And almost everything that has been said here for the last eight days, it is interesting how the Spirit seems to be telling the church in Asia, yes, we are reading the signs, but we don't remain with the signs. We may get utterly disillusioned with the sheer magnitude of issues and crises and conflicts and problems. Yes, we must read because we are rooted in reality. But we also need to ask what is the Spirit saying to the church in Asia? A question that was raised in the book of Revelation. And three, three words stand out. The church in Asia must be creative, must be inclusive, must be bridge building. Because the Father is creative. The Son is inclusive. And if His sacrifice on the cross was exclusive, then it means nothing to us. He died to save creation and humanity. And so everything that has been uttered here is pointing towards being a creative church, being an inclusive church, and being a bridge-building church. So I would like to suggest, a, next slide, a paradigm shift. I dare not call it a shift. Let's just call it a paradigm, both for worship and for formation. It must even re be reflected in the very language that we speak here in Asia. The very language that we use in worship and in formation, that it must be creative, inclusive, and bridge building. And as we were told in Bandung, be a new way of being church, not putting new wines in old wine skins, then it's going to burst. But a new way of being church, and in Chiang Mai, as the Asian Mission Congress, we were told that as Asians, we are storytellers. And we like to tell the story, share the story of Jesus. And Mongolia went further 
and said, let us whisper the gospel to everyone here in Asia. We are not in Asia going to lord it over. So, I suggest a paradigm. A paradigm for formation. And in the past, we have been very proud, maybe, and it has served us well, that we are a church of clergy, religious, and laity. Can I suggest that we go back to our roots, to our scriptural roots, and that we are a church of apostles? And I'm acutely aware that I'm speaking primarily to the successors of the apostles who are gathered here. And as successors of the apostles, we must hold the primacy of love, the primacy of truth. Edith Stein, Saint Edith Stein said, love and truth, one without the other is destructive. Love without truth or truth without love is destructive. We must hold the primacy of unity and continuity, not an emotional, sentimental unity, but a unity based on the continuation of the mission entrusted by the Father and the Son primarily to the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit to all of us. And we, the, the substitute for self-absorption or self-indulgence or self-preservation is the way of kenosis. That we are a church of primarily of disciples and that the primary sacrament is not the priesthood, is not marriage, but is disciples. Yes, we need clergy who are disciples. We need consecrated men and women who are disciples. And we need laity who are disciples. And the primary mission of disciples, especially of our lay brothers and sisters as disciples, is in the world. Not ministry in the church, which is necessary, but the primary mission of all the baptized is to be witnessing in the world, in society, on the way to work, as our speaker said. And finally, we are a church of the people of God, what Pope Francis calls Fratelli Tutti. So I wish to end now with two considerations, further considerations, that we move from membership to discipleship. And as I said, the unity that we speak about is based on the continuity of the mission entrusted to the apostles and to the disciples under the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. But let's not forget that this mission is primarily entrusted by the Father and the Son to the Holy Spirit. And therefore the Holy Spirit will succeed in the mission entrusted to the Spirit by the Father and the Son. And we, Pope Francis and all of us, are called to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And at this point, as we are midway through our conference, I ask that we remain faithful to the Holy Spirit by remaining faithful to the process that has been charted for us by Cardinal uh, Charles Bow and his entire team. Yes, we may be tired, or we have no right to be tired, as Arch Cardinal Krian Sak said, but let us be faithful to the process, and by being faithful to the process, be faithful to the Holy Spirit. And maybe in Asia, we got to move from a Christology and all the Christological debates of the first five centuries. Because Christ, Jesus Christ, did not bring us to himself and, he, and stop there. Beyond himself, he led us into the mystery of the Trinity. And therefore, we must move gently from Christology to the fullness of God as a community 
of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And finally, I suggest that Bandung gave us a triple dialogue, a dialogue with the poor, a dialogue with religions, a dialogue with culture. Can I suggest that we also need, especially in Asia, to excite our young people, to excite everyone, a dialogue of joy, the joy of the gospel, as Pope Francis calls it, a dialogue of mercy, the mercy of the Father of Jesus Christ, and a dialogue of hope, a hope generated by the Spirit. And 2025 is going to be the Jubilee year of hope. So what is going to the next slide? What is going to be the next crisis? God knows. Some are suggesting next next some are suggesting that there is a financial crisis coming soon or whether it's going to be a man-made tragedy or whether it's going to be a natural tragedy a laudato sea a disregard for laudato sea tragedy or whatever or another virus lurking somewhere but whatever it is let us play our role and Give Asia and the people of Asia and our churches in Asia the leadership that they are looking from us. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Bishop, uh, for your presentation and for your proposal for the new paradigm of the church that should be creative, inclusive and bridge building. Thank you very much. Let us now take two minutes of silence prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. I say to Bishop Francis that the right of tiring and resting is in heaven. <laughs> now, it's still time, so that we can have questions Question and, and answers. Answer. Yeah, we still have the floor. around 10 minutes, so... Please, those who want to intervene to express the comments or questions. Yeah. Please, Bishop Pascalis. Just to comment about the dialogue of joy and the dialogue of hope that uh, Bishop from Penang mentioned before. I think uh, this is a main role also that we can offer to the world 
because Jesus, as uh, he preached the gospel, and we know that the meaning of the gospel is to bring good news for the people. And thank you for uh, the mention about this aspect of our faith. And I really want to underline the joy of the gospel. And then we bring also the dialogue of joy and the dialogue of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Please, uh, Bishop. I just wanted to share the need for catechesis, especially through digital ways, which was emphasized by our uh, young friend uh, Karpayo from Mumbai. Uh, really, that is one of the main tasks that we have to take up in our ministry or the bishops and priests in future. That means integrating digital ways of communicating the message of Christ and the love of Christ to our children and the youth uh, through di digital ways. I think from accompaniment alone, we will not do that. We have to work with them in catechetical formation. As we walk with our uh, candidates to priesthood in the seminaries, we have to walk with them, discuss with them, take their ways of communication as our ways of communication for uh, catechesis and bringing the message of Christ uh, to them. So that is a very important field in which our young friend is just uh, calling us to engage ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop. Please. It's not a question. I'm Philip Neri Ferram from India. I don't want, not a question, just a comment. I really want to appreciate the various inputs and very especially what Bishop Sebastian said last. Ecclesiology of discipleship. We are so used to talk about clergy, religious, laity. This terminology somehow separates us. I think ecclesiology of discipleship, that all of us are disciples who are baptized, sent with different functions in the church. I, I really appreciate this input of Bishop Sebastian. Thank you, Bishops. One more <laughs> or two, and then I will give opportunity to the speakers to give their comments also, please. I am Archbishop Jayanti Cruz from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, all these talks this morning were very enlightening and helpful, thought-provoking. Uh, uh, we need to really enter into the digital world in order to make ourselves present in Asia more and more so that we can influence Asia. And then a last talk uh, by Bishop Sebastian Francis, uh, worship in spirit and truth, though it is very old idea from the gospel, but Asia, this can be the big means, the good way to enter into interreligious dialogue. We can go beyond our traditional things, worship in truth uh, and spirit, and joy and hope we can bring to Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. My, I am I'm from the Philippines, uh, Bishop Colin, uh, from uh, the Diocese of Kitapawan, uh, Mindanao. My point really is not a question, but I would like to, to, to uh, make a comment uh, with regards to the uh, future of the church in terms of its uh, evangelization. Really, we have to admit and we have to uh, uh, look seriously that uh, we have to enter into the digital world in terms of evangelization. And uh, EWTN in America and in many parts of the world 
has proven to be very effective uh, uh, in their evangelization program. Here in Asia, we have Radio Veritas Asia. My point is, I wonder if we can come up with some kind of a resolution or with some kind of, a, of an agreement. Uh, let's come up with some kind of, uh, of uh, Radio Veritas Asia that is almost as equal and as similar and as effective and aggressive as AWTN. Uh, I, I, I learned uh, that a good friend of mine, Bishop from Sri Lanka, Bishop uh, Raymond, will become the next head of Radio Veritas. And I think, uh, Radio Veritas Asia, and I think uh, he would need all our support that uh, Radio Veritas Asia uh, would become uh, almost like EWTN uh, to enter into, uh, into that digital world of being able to spread the word of God all over Asia. And therefore, what I'm trying to say is, uh, can we as FABC make that commitment, make that resolution that we support and we endorse Radio Veritas Asia to go into that field of digital work in terms of aggressive uh, evangelization for Asia. Thank you. Thank you. The, last. the, the two last before we go to break, <laughs> please. Thank you for giving me the chance. The, from the last presentation, His Excellency presented wonderfully so many good points. And one of the important points for me, the dialogue of cultures. And the, oh, in this point, what he mentioned about the people of God, Fratelli Tutti. And especially in Indian subcontinent and Indian cultures, many times in the church, we use the uh, many castes, scheduled castes, so many vocabularies. And for me, I would like to abolish all these words. Because these inferior people create different castes and classes, but what Bishop mentioned, and especially the Holy Father, Fratelli Tutti, people of God, and that will help us for the evangelization. We can dignify people and bring them to the same dignity, and it is useful, especially in Asia and especially India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, in these countries. And that is why I would uh, strongly propose abolishing all this terminology and vocabularies and using people of God, Fratelli Tutti. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Cardinal. Well, not to be too long. I just want to support Bishop Sebastian, I think all the presentations this morning has been summarized with a big challenge that uh, as Bishop Sebastian has done. Mainly is to go to the gospel. We have a lot of theological jargons. We have a lot of pastoral, uh, uh, very trivial thoughts. But I think if Asia has to have any specific contribution, the voice has been heard. Paradigm shift is needed. 
missionary discipleship has to be emphasized. People of God we have to walk with. And these are the parameters uh, for us to go to the gospel of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, on behalf of all of us here, I want to thank all our four speakers this morning. We appreciate all your enriching and precious presentation, your thoughts and your say. So let us give once again a big applause.